You guys can open up your Bibles, if you will, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. You know, uh, I know last week uh, at our Christmas uh, banquet, I said that I was going to do the first part last week of a two-part little lesson. Well, uh, I've changed my mind. Uh, after several conversations and praying about what I was going to speak about, I, I'd, I'd already written the lesson for today, but I realized, you know, that's not what God was putting in my heart to talk about. So I'm still going to talk about Christmas. We're still going to look at the Christmas story. But, uh, you know, a theme this week really came about that I realized, you know, this is what we need to talk about a little bit more than uh, what was I, I was planning on speaking of. You know, and it's good that, you know, when God has something he wants you to talk about, it's good to listen to him and actually speak about what he wants you to talk about. Amen? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, there's a scripture here that many of us are very familiar with. It says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You know, do you believe that scripture? You know, sometimes we can look at this scripture and go, yeah, that's an awesome scripture. You're right. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And, and yet, so often we can get stuck in the I can't modes. And several conversations that I had this week had to deal with I can't. I can't do this or I can't do that or I'm not able to do this or I'm not able to do that or yeah, this is not going to work out. I just can't do it. And we quit or we stop doing the things that we're supposed to do. And to me, you know, Paul, when he wrote this, he understood very well that the trials of life are going to get in the way sometimes. At least they're going to seem to. Uh, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be hardships. Paul understood having been beaten many times because of his faith, having been persecuted a lot, having been thrown in jail and writing this letter even from jail. He understood that I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. He understood to be able to do everything, it wasn't because He was supernatural. It wasn't because He was special. It wasn't because He was super talented. It was simply because He was going to rely on God. He put His faith in Jesus and was going to let Jesus and God do the work through Him. You know, I think for this reason, uh, you know, this season, it, one of the greatest lessons we can learn is that God can do anything in our lives. Today I've entitled my lesson, I can this Christmas. I can this Christmas. And I want to look at a few things that we can do and that we need to do. I want to look at the story of Jesus being born and the birth of, of Jesus, the, the whole nativity scene, and look at really what does it mean for us in being able to say, I can this Christmas. Amen? Turn over to Luke chapter 1. Let's jump in. My first point, I can accept the impossible. I can accept the impossible. Luke chapter 1. Verse 26 is where we're going to pick up. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I can accept the impossible. God wants to do the impossible, the improbable, and the spectacular. Are we willing to accept it and go along for the rise? In Luke chapter 1, we read this starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. You know, the first part of our lesson today, the first point is I can accept the impossible. And really we have to learn from Mary. Mary was a young girl, maybe 14, 15, 16 years old. She was engaged to be married, and really in her custom, she was already married to a man, though they hadn't consummated the marriage. She was still living with her parents. She was out in the field or out someplace working or doing something, and an angel comes to her, and he says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone came up to you on the street and said that greeting to you, how would you feel? 
Would you be like, that is the most awesome greeting. Thank you so very much. You might be like, all right, do I know you? I don't think I even know who you are. You know, if someone came up to you that you had no idea who they were, they are bright and shiny, you were out in the middle of the field, it was just you and this bright and shiny dude, he goes, greetings to you, who are highly favored. You'd be like, is he talking to me? You know, why is he talking to me? First in his culture, men and women didn't really talk to each other. It was frowned upon. So there's that fact. Then this guy's a bright, shiny dude. He's kind of angelic looking, you know, and he's like, greetings. The Lord is with you. You know, you're kind of like, okay, the Bible says that she was greatly troubled by that. She's like, well, what kind of greeting? You know, what, what? That wasn't a standard greeting. And if you think about it, when you see somebody, you, go, you don't come up and go, hey, Shane, greetings. The Lord is with you. Shane would be like, okay, thanks, man. You know, he just wouldn't know how to, to react to my greeting. Because that's not a standard greeting, right? We say hi, we say, hey, hey, what's up? How's it going? You know, that's more of the, kind of the standard greeting. So the first of all, you know, Mary's got to get over the fact that this angel has greeted her in a special way. Then he tells her something astounding. Mary, you're going to have a baby. He's going to be God's son. He's going to sit on the throne of David's. And his kingdom's going to last forever. And she's like, okay, uh, how's that going to happen? You know? See, we've got to put it a little bit in context. I think as a parent, I envision what my family's, my sons are going to do later in life. But really, it's hard to see. You know, I hope that things are good for them and, you know, things are going well and stuff like that. You know, it's great to have Megan's parents here. I'm sure if we would have talked to Megan's parents, you know, uh, 20 years ago, you know, they had dreams and aspirations for their daughter, Megan, but they couldn't imagine her spending 12 years in college and then finally graduating. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, they have a vision, but, you know, to, to actually see it happening, that's, that takes a lot for, for us. You know, even for our own lives, can you tell me what you're going to see happening next month? You know, what if, I, I was teasing Linda today earlier in children's ministry, but let, let me pick on somebody else. How about Lemana? What if I said Lemana, you know what's exciting? Starley is going to become the first woman president in the United States. How do you think Lemana's going to feel? I think she's, you know, in her heart she might be like, oh, that's cool, that's cherry, all right, whatever, awesome. But do you think she's going to say, wow, I'm going to be in the White House. I'm going to go visit my daughter. I want, you know, I'm going to start repainting the West Wing. And, you know, <laughs> she doesn't do that. She's got a vision. Like, like she might, uh, okay, she might accept it. But to have a true vision of what that means, that, like, wow, that was a lot. And yet what we learn from Mary is that she says, well, how's this going to be done? And then the angel says, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to get pregnant. Then you're going to have a child. He's going to grow up and he's going to become the king of Israel. He's going to sit on David's throne and he's going to rule all of Israel for eternity. Mary's like, okay, that sounds awesome. But we have to understand she was just a common girl. She wasn't of royalty. It's not like she was living at the palace at the time and could see that happening. But she goes, at the end, she goes, well, I'm the Lord's servant. May your will be done. May His will be done. You know, may it be done as He says. See, she was willing to accept the impossible. That God is a God of the impossible. That He can do the impossible in our lives. I think so often we get stuck in the I can't because I'm not very special. I'm not that important. I'm not that talented. I'm not that great. And yet God says you don't have to be. See, the lesson we had to learn from Mary is that we don't have to necessarily have all these great talents and all this position and all this great education for God to do the impossible in our lives. We just have to be willing to accept that God wants to do the impossible in our lives. And that's what Mary was willing to do. When I read this, I was like, wow, she was willing. He says to her at the start, he says, don't be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. See, I think at first she could have said, how am I highly esteemed? Why does God look at me with favor? Who am I? Have you guys ever prayed that prayer before? God, who am I that you would choose me or that you would bless me in this way? I know that I think that all the time. I know that, okay, I've got a master's degree. I, you know, I've accomplished a little bit of my life. But really in the end, who am I? What have I done with my life that makes me to be able to stand up here and preach? That gives me the opportunity to be in part of God's kingdom. The, to, to see the impossible done through my life. 
The answer is nothing. I was making fun of Christians before I became one. I was persecuting my brother before I became a Christian. That's where I came from. My friends would get, have to get up and go to church on Sunday. I'd be like, yeah, hey, see you later. Have fun, Bible banger. That's how I used to treat people when I was a kid, you know? And I'd go about my, my business and live my life. And, you know, I wasn't doing good things in my life before God called me. And yet, I looked down and I was like, wow. When we're willing to accept the call of God, we're willing to say, God, you can do the impossible through me. That that's what I'm willing to accept. That's who Mary was. You know, I was reminded of this just even this last couple weeks with our brother Eric. I'm so grateful for our brother Eric and, uh, you know, what a great example of perseverance he's been. You know, to say that Eric has had, has been made a major impact, is doing awesome things here, would not necessarily be truthful. You know, it's great to see him up here singing. I appreciate his heart to try to do something that maybe he's not the most talented at, but he's willing to, hey, God wants me to sing, lead songs. Amen. I'll lead songs. You know, I remember when he first started leading songs. There were a lot of us, <laughs> Eric's leading songs. But he's still up here leading them. And we aren't, so we should probably just be quiet and sing along. Amen. I appreciate his heart. But Eric's been going through a tough time looking for work and struggling and stuff like that. But he's just been, you know, feeling like, okay, I'm, I've blown it. I've sinned too much. God can't use me anymore. And, you know, I've really been trying to help him like, hey, God still loves you. He still believes in you, you know. So about two weeks ago, Eric finally got a job. Isn't that awesome? That's exciting. But that's not the good news. So Eric gets a job. He goes to work and, and the guy sits down with him. The, the high and said, hey, Eric, you know, what are some of your long-term goals? He's like, well, I would like to see a church planted in, Ca in Canada where I'm from. And I'd like to go be there. So the guy's like, okay, that's cool. So what are you doing to see those goals achieved? And Eric's like, mm, nothing. You know, I'm not doing anything. You know, I'm being homeless and out of work here in Hawaii. So, of course, you know, that means he's ready to go to Canada, right? <laughs> So Eric decides, you know what, I'm just going to pray and ask God to, to, do, to show me. So he emails a guy that's from Canada in the church. It's a leader in our church. And, uh, you know, at the time, the, the brother's in Paris, France. He says, hey, Tim, when, when was the church going to Canada? Because I want to go. Tim emails him back. He goes, that's exciting. Because in two hours, I'm announcing we're starting the Toronto Church of Christ this year. Isn't that exciting? So... So Tim goes, do you want to go? Eric's like, uh, yes. Yes, I would like to go. He's like, great, in 2014, we're going to be starting the, the Toronto church, and we would like you come to be part of the mission team. And Eric's like, wow, that's cool. And so he comes and he talks to me, you know. He's, he's like, bro, this is side, and this is what I was doing. He's telling me the story. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. And I go, what, when is it going to happen? He goes, oh, you know, because they just announced it. It's probably not going to be till August or September or something like that. Like, all right, well, we've got a little time to work and stuff like that, you know. So I get done talking to Eric. About an hour later, Tim calls me. Hey, bro, I want to know about this guy named Boomer. <laughs> well, let me tell you about Eric. <laughs> How much time you got, Tim? What time is it there in Paris? You don't even go to bed early, do you? You know, and it, it was late, but we had a really good talk. And I said, hey, these are the things about Eric that I love. He's, he's per, you know, he perseveres through a lot. He's, he's done a lot and, and he's gregarious. He's out of himself. He's willing to do things that other people aren't willing to do. And he's giving. He can be a great servant. And he's a hard worker at times. Now, let me tell you the bad things about Eric. And, man, I, you know, that was like an hour or two. So we spent a lot of time talking, you know, about who Eric is. In the end, Tim goes, okay, I want him, bro. Can he come with us to Toronto? I'm like, bro, if it's the Lord's will, absolutely. We would gladly send him, you know? You know, for someone to step out and go, God, here's my prayer. Do the impossible. He had just got a job. He's going to be leaving in less than about a month to go to Toronto. There's a mission team of seven people going. Three married couples and Eric. <laughs> Amen? You know, we have a month to pour our hearts into Eric, to love him and to give him, but to say, I can. I can accept the impossible, that Eric is going to be the foundation of all the singles ministry in all of Canada. <laughs> and those of us who know Eric go, God help Canada. <laughs> But they're a little backward up there, eh? So uh, it'll be okay, you know? 
but no. But we know that when we have a willing heart, and that's the thing I appreciate about Eric. He's got a willing heart to see God do the impossible. He's looking at his life going, okay, I'm not really, haven't been doing anything spectacular here. It's not like I've been leading a Bible talk and preaching lessons all the time and doing all these things. And Tim's giving him a list of like 15 things he needs to try to do before he leaves. And it's like, all right, there's a lot of things like balance a checkbook and stuff like that and, you know, things that he's not used to doing. But it's like, all right, this is character changing time. It's not easy when God asks you to do the impossible. But we've got to be willing to say, I can accept the impossible, that God can do the impossible through me. And I think all of us need to be challenged and called higher, amen? amen? This Christmas, we've got to say, I can. I can accept the impossible. I can do the things that God wants to do through me. Not because I can do them necessarily, but I can do everything through Him who gives me strength, amen? amen. Turn over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. My second point, I can do the right thing. I can do the right thing. We spoke about this a little bit last week, and so I'm just going to be reiterating a little bit what we talked about last week in looking at Joseph. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. I can do the right thing. Matthew 1 verse 18, the Bible says this. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together... She was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. You know, when we read the story about Joseph, what we read about is a man who decided to do what was right. To do the right thing. I think there's so much pressure on us sometimes not to do the right thing, but to give in to what everybody else wants us to do, to give in to what everybody else would do. And yet just Joseph wasn't that type of guy. It says in verse 19, he was a righteous man. Well, what does that mean to be a righteous person? Well, I think the, thing, the theme that I read here and that to me just really stands out in Joseph was to be about mercy, forgiveness, and love. To do the right thing is to be about mercy, forgiveness, and love. I think so often in our society, and so often we can want payback. We can want justice to be done. That we can get angry when someone's not penalized for their wrongdoing. And yet we learn from Joseph that it says here that he didn't want to expose Mary to public d disgrace. He was hurt. When he saw her pregnant, when she came back from being with her cousin Elizabeth, she was pregnant. He's like, wow. And of course, the only conclusion that you could draw is she must have had an adulterous relationship. She must have cheated on me. Rather than being angry and bitter at her, he decided in his heart, okay, I'm just going to divorce her quietly. I'm going to break my contract with her family, and I'm just going to walk away, and I'm not going to deal with it. And really that took a lot in those days. It takes a lot in our days to forgive and walk away when someone hurts us, does it not? And yet I think this is one of the greatest challenges we have. To do the right thing. And the right thing, the thing that every single person in this room needs. Every single person that we run into needs. Is mercy, love, and forgiveness. To do the right thing is to offer those things in our hearts to those people. I had a great conversation yesterday with Megan's brother John. And we were talking about that. He runs a, uh, he's a warden of a penitentiary for young, young boys over in Oahu. And they're the, the worst offenders. And yet what he's trying to choose is, to do is to change the culture. Realizing that what those boys need more than anything is not punishment. They're getting that. But what they need is forgiveness. Forgiveness and love. First, to be able to learn how to forgive themselves. 
And then to learn to forgive other people who might have hurt them, who might have led them astray, or might have been a part of them making the decisions they made. And we had a great conversation just about that and how important that is. You know, I was reminded in the news, if you've been watching the news at all, there was a story that happened in Texas just a couple weeks ago. Well, the, the story happened a long time ago, but uh, there was a decision made, a judge made a decision. A boy, a uh, high school boy, was out with some friends partying, and he got very drunk. His blood alcohol level was 0.24, which is like three times the legal limit. So while he was drunk, he uh, stole his, someone's car, his dad's work truck, was driving that and ran into a group of people and killed four people. Killed a mom and her daughter, a pastor of a church, and then a, another guy. And then wounded a couple of other people. So what is everybody screaming for there in Texas? Justice. We want justice. This boy needs to pay. When I read the news at first, I was, I was like, wow, this is so horrific. The judge let him off. He was caught on the scene. He was guilty. But the judge said, you're free. Everybody's like, we can't believe it. The defense had offered up for their defense that the, the boy suffered from what is called affluenza because his family is very rich. So he suffered from affluenza, affluence, to have wealth, to have money. And they said because he's very rich, he's never been taught the consequences of his bad behavior. His parents spoiled him. Whenever he did something wrong, he was just told, hey, try not to do that again. He was given gifts. His mom and dad had went through a, a horrific divorce, and so they spoiled him all the more. So when he ran into the crowd and he got drunk, he didn't know any better. And the judge said, okay. And she let him off. Everybody's completely upset. When I read that, I was mad. And I don't even know the boy. And I don't even know the families, the people who got him. But I'm like, that's just wrong. There's got to be punishment for that, shouldn't there? And really in our hearts, in our minds, in our society today, we are very penal in our, in our wanting to punish people for their wrongs. Now, should there be some type of consequence? Yes. But I want you to stop and think for this boy. He killed four people. I don't care who you are. Do you think he'll ever be able to forgive himself for that? No. He may not understand the consequences. But to walk around day after day after day realizing I killed four people by my actions. The guilt that's got to be in his heart. And if he walks around like an affront, then you know he has just hardened his heart so hard. Because that's what you'd have to do to be able to walk around with that guilt and still to survive. You know what he needs? Forgiveness. See, Joseph understood that what Mary needed was forgiveness. Then the angel was able to help him to see, hey, it's the Holy Spirit. She's pregnant from the Holy Spirit. This is God's child. And you need to take care of that. What if Joseph had decided not to do the right thing? What if he had taken her out like, I can't believe you did this to me. And in his day, he could have had her stoned and killed because of her adulterous relationship. Could you imagine her sitting there and, but I didn't cheat. I didn't have an adulterous relationship. The baby inside me is from God. And everybody's like, shut up. Quit lying. And getting the rocks and the anger and the hate that even her own parents... Could you imagine her trying to say, Mom, Dad, look, the baby is from God. <laughs> Could you imagine that? The, it's, it's God's child. God made me pregnant. Mary, just tell us the truth. Could you imagine? I imagine that conversation went on in their household. But Joseph decided to be a man who did the right. He said, I can do the right thing. I can show mercy, and I can show forgiveness. This Christmas season, can we? That's what people need. More than, more than they need the new Xbox, or this new camera, or this new sweater, or new Christmas tie, or whatever else they need. They need love, and mercy, and forgiveness. We need those things. Is there something you need to forgive yourself for? You need to look at your own heart and say, hey, I've been guilty because of this, this, and this in my life for a long time. I want to encourage you. Unwrap it and get rid of it. 
Send it on like that piece of fruit bread that comes, fruit cake that comes to your house that you don't really want, you know? Give it to the, give it to the you know, post office person or whatever, you know, and say, here's a gift for you. But in all seriousness, we gotta start by forgiving ourselves. We all blow it many times. Joseph was a man who did the right thing. He understood the most important thing. It wasn't his hurt, but was be willing to forgive and to quietly say, okay, I'm not going to hold Mary accountable for what she's done. Because justice will only go so far. If we want justice, we've got to understand the whole story of Jesus dying on the cross is not about justice. We can't accept the forgiveness from the cross and God saying, hey, I'm not going to treat you as your sins deserve, and yet demand justice in other people. Justice, we may, you know, this kid may be thrown in jail or have to pay millions of dollars in restitution and stuff like that, but will that undo what he did? Will that bring back any of the people that got killed? No. The, the, the choice that people have to make is saying, all right, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to forgive first myself in my heart, and then I'm going to forgive others, those who hurt me, those who maybe have disappointed me, those who have scarred me. That's what the story of the cross is about. That's the story of Jesus being born. It's Emmanuel, God with us. God saying, I love you, and I want to be with you every single day of your life. There's nothing you can do to take away Jesus. He's already been given for us. For us, let's do the right thing. Let's say, I can do the right thing this Christmas. Amen? And finally, in Matthew chapter 2, I can seek the truth. I can seek the truth. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has, has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be a sh the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful, a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so, I, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, this story, of course, of the three, the three kings, the three magi, is one that's very popular. I mean, we've all heard it many times, I'm sure. But in, in most, like most stories of antiquity, sometimes the truth can be lost. And some of those things we've got to understand, dig it a little deeper to really see and understand in the story. It says here that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during that time, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? Well, the word Magi stood for scholar in the Persian Empire. So most biblical scholars believe that they came from Persia, which was Babylon and, and further out which would today be uh, like Afghanistan and that type of area, Iran, somewhere over in that area. Their travel to get to Jerusalem was about 800 miles. A lot of times what we do is we see, you know, we've got the nativity scene set up our house, most of us do, or, you know, we've seen the movie and stuff like that. And so the babies, the little babies in the manger, and they come riding up on their camels, and they get down, and he's, you know, he's a fresh little baby just having been born the day before or something like that. Most scholars, people who studied the story out, believe Jesus was probably one, one and a half, two years old by the time the Magi make it there. Because traveling through the desert, if they left the moment that the star appears and took off on their camels, a camel travels at about 12 miles a day, top speeds. 12 miles a day. They didn't take the plane. They didn't have trains back then. They didn't jump in their Model T Fords 
or any other car, they took the camel. So not only did they drive a camel 800 miles, so it, figure out, you do the math, it would take about 80 days of straight just marching through the desert and a camel. So that's about two months. So we know at least, at the very, very minimum, two months went by. But do you think you just travel 80 days straight through the deserts? No, you gotta gonna go where the water is. So you zigzag. And a lot of times they would go and they would come to a town and they would stop and spend a couple days there or a week there or even a month at a town and stuff like that, get their stores replenished and then they would move on to the next place. And then they would move on to the next place. So most scholars believe that they traveled for about a year and a half to get to, to see Jesus. Then the star, it says the star appeared to them in the east but there's kind of a little hint. It says that when the star reappears after they leave Herod in Jerusalem, it says the star they had seen in the east in verse 9, it says and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until they stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the, saw, saw the star, they were overjoyed. They'd been traveling. The star wasn't there the whole time. The star had appeared when Jesus was born and then it disappears. Now, I don't know about you, they're from Persia. So, most likely, they were not Jew Jews. They weren't of Jewish descent. They were of Persian descent. Now, there's a chance because Daniel, we know the book of Daniel was written in Persia. Daniel was taken captive and was in Persia. So, it was written, so there were still a few people left behind. And yet, during that time, anybody who was really, uh, you know, worship, a, Jew, a Jew or a, a strong worshiper of God came back to Jerusalem. So there weren't a lot of people who were of Jewish descent that were left behind that stayed faithful to the Ju Judean uh, religion. So they had probably studied about Judaism and maybe read in the book of Daniel. Daniel talks about in chapter 9 the baby being born in Jerusalem, the, the, the king coming. And so they knew they needed to go to Jerusalem to find the new baby king to worship him. So maybe they, maybe they were of Jewish background, so a Judean descent, or he had converted Judaism. However, they were living in a country in Persia that was mostly pagan in nature. They stood up and stood out in a crowd of people, thousands, millions of people who did not worship like them. The major religion at the time is a religion called Taoism. Taoism, what was taking place in Persia. And in fact, uh, Christian history shows that one of these guys would go back and begin the first Christian church underneath the Sallust temple. So most likely this guy had been a Sallust uh, worshiper at the time, but had gone back to his temple and where the Sallust church was, temple up above, he built a tr Christian church down below underneath the grounds. That's a historical fact. So one of these guys converted and became a Christian after he worshiped Jesus in Jerusalem. But it's not because uh, there were a whole bunch of people. He just simply decided to seek the truth. He decided to travel 800 miles with his friends on camels through the desert for a year and a half to seek the truth, to worship Jesus. You know, what keeps you from seeking the truth? You know, what is it that keeps you from waking up in the morning and reading the Bible? Is it because you have to travel 800 miles by camel through a desert to get to the Bible so you can read and learn about Jesus? No. Is it because you can't push the on button on your phone? Download the app that says Bible? Open it up? Oh, I don't have Wi-Fi here. Good, I can't read my Bible. All right, well, can't read my Bible. You know? Maybe it's because you don't have a computer. Maybe it's because you don't have a book. Maybe you don't have a TV. Maybe you don't have a fax machine, or maybe you don't have a phone. Think of all the ways that we can get in touch with the Bible, and yet we choose not to. When we don't read our Bibles on a daily basis, it's simply because we're not seeking the truth. I don't want to know what the truth says. I don't want to know what the Scriptures say. You know, it's amazing to me, when I read this, it struck me in verse 4. They, they get to King Herod, they go, hey... Where's the king of the Jews? He's just been born. We want to go worship him. And it says, He calls together all the chief priests, all the teachers of the law, and he asks them where the Christ was to be born. You know what? They knew. They knew where Jesus was to be born. He had been there for a year and a half. And yet no one had said a thing. 
None of them had gone to worship the king. None of them. They read, they knew the scriptures. Oh, the, the prophet said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, how many of them had gone to Bethlehem to go worship? The answer was none. None. Because they weren't seeking the truth. They were more afraid for their position. See, King Herod was an evil, wicked man. And he was just looking to kill Jesus. He wasn't going to go worship him. And we know the story later on that he would kill all the boys in, in that area from two years younger. Why two years younger? Because Jesus was probably roughly about two years old. Because he finds out how old was this boy. When did you see the vision? Exactly when was the time? Okay, he gives himself a little bit of a window. Okay, we're going to do two years to, to birth. Because roughly it was about a year ago, a year and a half ago that they saw the sign of the star. And yet we realize that, wow, all these religious people, all these Jews who knew the prophecies, they did not go worship Jesus. Because the truth wasn't as important as what other people thought. See, I think sometimes we're in a society where a, there's a lot of people who don't believe in the truth, who don't want to know what the Bible has to say. They just want to live their lives and be pleasing to themselves and live for their own pleasure. And Oh yeah, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to be this. I was one of those people. When I first started going to church, I still went out partying and womanizing and getting drunk and stuff like that. And I thought it was okay. But it's because I never decided to read the Bible and actually put it into life, into practice in my life. See, I wasn't living by the truth because I really didn't want to know what God was going to say about who I am. See, we've got to decide, I can seek the truth this Christmas. There's nothing that's more important than getting up in the morning and unwrapping the package of love that God wants to give you. Reading it and saying, okay, what's this say? How can I put this into practice in my life? What do I need to do with this scripture? And then to live by it. There's surely a lot of people around us who don't want to know the truth, who don't want to live by it, who just want to hold on to their own opinions, their own thoughts. You know, there's battles going on around all over the place. And yet we've got to decide, I'm going to live by the truth. I can seek the truth. I can follow the example of these three guys. Not only do they come, then they put down all of their treasures. You know, most people don't know how many, how many scholars there were, how many magi there were. The Bible never says. But do they say three because there were three gifts? Well, that may be the case. There might have been 20 of them, for all we know. And maybe they just all piled on those three gifts, you know. But maybe there were just three. It doesn't matter. What matters is that they sought the truth. They saw the signs. They saw the star and they said, the king of the Jews has been born. We have to go worship him. We've got to spend the time to go get close to him. We've got to spend the effort, make the effort to have a relationship with this guy. One of them would later go back and, like I said, begin the first Christian church in all of Persia. The building still exists today, thousands of years old, a tribute to a man who sought the truth and found it in God, that God is with us, that God loves us. See, when we seek the truth, God says, you'll find it, because God's looking for us and wants a relationship with us. He directed their steps. He showed them the exact sign and made it so they could make it to where they needed to go. He even used evil men to point them in the right direction. See, God will use anybody to point us in the right direction if we truly seek Him this Christmas time. Amen? Amen? You know, this Christmas, I want you to have an I can Christmas. I want you to have a Christmas where you can decide to accept the impossible. To look back at 2013 and say, wow, look at all the great things God did. The ways, the places He's taken me, the, the places He's brought me. 2014, I'm going to accept the impossible. That God can do the impossible in my life. If God wants to do it, He can do it. Because I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. I can even do the impossible. Amen? We need to decide to have a, a I can do the right thing this Christmas. I can do the right thing. I can be love. I can forgive. I can show mercy and kindness to other people. It's the greatest gift that we can give. There's nothing under the tree that will compare to the gift of forgiveness that we can give. You know, this Christmas, today even, I'd like you to think about who is it you need to forgive. 
Who is it that you need to let go of that hurt and say, I'm going to do the right thing? Because God, the story of Jesus being born, the story of Jesus' life is simply, I love you and I forgive you. I want a relationship with you. And if that's what God is willing to do for us, we should be willing to do it to anybody else. Amen? And finally, we've got to decide I can seek the truth this Christmas. I'm not going to let all the holiday fever, I'm not going to let all the, the Christmas tree and the lights and cooking and all the guests and everything else keep me from seeking the truth first. This is the most important thing. I don't have to travel 800 miles on a donkey or on a camel through the deserts. I just simply need to get up, pick up the book, and read. I can this Christmas. Amen? Thank you and God bless.